Alawapa, dear friends, and welcome. I think maybe we can give a couple of minutes um, for everybody to join us. Maybe we can have like a three minute window for, um, for people who are just coming in right now. Just give people two more minutes to join so everyone can take advantage of the entire session which I just want to reiterate to everybody will be in English. So people are coming in and perhaps we can just welcome people as I do my introduction. Is that all right, Ms. Uh, Dr. McCurdy? Yep. Okay. So welcome and alawapa, dear friends, to the first of two sessions exploring the uh, panorama of social change that uh, is announced in the recent Universal House of Justice letter dated 30th of December, 2021. Uh, we are very lucky today to have with us Dr. Elaine McCreary. Uh, Dr. McCreary has been learning about the revelation of Baha'u'llah through service and teaching Baha'i studies at the university level, as well as in deepening programs. So I, I think that we can start we can start with um, Dr. McCurry has uh, organized an extremely efficient and well organized um, uh, program um, because I've already done one of these with my community, and uh, I, I think that doc, when I when I was looking over Dr. McCurry's um, uh, the, the way that she had organized her exploration, I was extremely impressed by the, the efficacy and efficiency um, with which she is going to present this. So you're all very lucky to be here um, and, and take, take part in um, an exploration that is going to be done with such expertise and love. So without further ado, Dr. McCurry, we're with you. Aloha pa, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, the presentation is with love, and for that, we will ask uh, Dr. Farhangpur to start us with a prayer. Uh, glory be to thee, O Lord, my God. Make manifest the rivers of thy sovereign might, that the waters of thy unity may flow through the inmost realities of our things, in such wise that the banner of thine unfailing guidance may be raised aloft the kingdom of thy command and the stars of thy divine splendor may shine brightly in the heaven of thy majesty. Potent art thou to do what Pleased thee, thou verily art the help imperial, the self subsisting, Baha'u'llah. So, friends, what we have today is a co presentation by some Canadian Baha'is uh, to help us all effectively study this communication from the Universal House of Justice. It's very large, very deep, but we are supposed to understand it so we can 
live it. Only by living it with its new vision, new attitudes, new capacities, and new kinds of action on all of our parts will we actually grow into understanding it. So let's begin. Many people say this is a historic letter. On what basis? True, true, when we look backwards, we haven't seen a 14 page letter from the Universal House of Justice for perhaps 25 years back in the early beginnings of the Institute process. And when we look forward, we know that this letter is going to be of influence for at least nine years. And in each of those years, we will have a Rizwan letter that updates us and gives us new advice. But this is the mother letter. If we look even farther forward, this letter begins a 25 year a series of plans to release the society building power of the faith, to release it. That means the society building power is already with us in the revelation. But this letter is historic for more reasons. This letter actually teaches us what history is. History is not something that just happens to us. That's a very passive attitude and it breeds fear. When you look around society, people who are living without the revelation are living in degrees of fear because of the uncertainty. This letter in its entirety teaches us that history is something that we make. We mold it, we shape it out of the events and the trends that are flowing towards us. Abdu'l-Baha likens the greater plan of God to a river. It has a flow, it has characteristics, it has a direction, but the lesser plan of God to which we adhere is like a boat that we can actively steer within the river individually in our own lives, but also collectively. It's more like a ship, a great ship. So I invite you to think of this letter as the blueprint of a great ship that we are building. It enfolds us with a unifying purpose to all of our diversity of locations and our diversity of activities. This ship will be large enough to hold all of humanity eventually. But today, there are only a few of us on board. We are spreading out the framework of this great ship. The ship is an emerging global culture of justice, unlike anything any of us have ever seen. It's a new way of living together that will, as the prayer says, render this netherworld the mirror image of the divine kingdom that we all yearn to attain. So how are we going to study this blueprint? For years, the House of Justice has been telling us to be systematic. So our format today will alternate between a brief outline that I will uh, offer you, followed by a reading of the full text, thanks to our team of four. And then we'll return to the outline with some detail to fix in our minds what we've just heard, so that in future, as we live this, we'll be able to go to the exact section of the letter that gives us the guidance we need. Now here's the outline. If a screen share works. <laughs> this letter of the House of Justice, can you all see it? Somebody tell me you can see it. <laughs> I this can see it. Oh, okay, thank you so much. This letter is, is given to us by the House 
in seven sections. They didn't actually, uh, the house did not actually use the word introduction. It gave us the titles, the movement of clusters, learning from the most advanced clusters, contributing to social transformation. And that's how far we will go today. But then it goes on to the purpose, which is how educational endeavors broadly and the training institute in particular will help to lift, enliven and enlighten humanity and how this is going to cause a transformation in what we have all known as the world order of Baha'u'llah, the administrative order itself is going to respond with new capacities that it has not used before and then there's a concluding section. So today we'll start with the introduction and it did not have a title, but I'm pointing out to you that this introduction has exactly one sentence on the past and four paragraphs on the future. And this is in sharp contrast to the Rizwan letter from April, 2021, when in that letter, the House of Justice put six and a half pages on our past achievements the last 25 years with the Institute progress, uh, Institute process. And at the end, it put one paragraph on the coming one year plan to be followed by a nine year plan. Not only is the proportion of that Rizwan letter and this letter so very different. The Rizwan letter began with the phrase, the final words in a most memorable chapter in the history of the cause have now been written and the page turns. And the last sentence in that letter of Rizwan said, the divine plan enters a new epoch, the page is turned. So here we are, friends, here we are. We're on the new page. And the first section of the new page has four paragraphs, which will be read by our friends. The paragraphs tell us that the new capacities and achievements of this coming period will eclipse the past. As glorious, as glorious as the past um, uh, epochs have been, in, the, um, in this age of, of constructing the administrative order. This word fortify does not suggest conflict. From the French folk, it means strong. This will strengthen, it's, we're used to hearing the word galvanize. It will galvanize the community. And then having moved from this moment in history, watch how it comes down. It starts with this moment in history all across the world. Then it says, we, the people of the lesser covenant, we came forth from nothingness to apply the teachings. That's the reason for living. That's why each of us was born to apply the teachings for the betterment of the world. Now, of all of us, we're not all quite the same because there are actually three protagonists in the Baha'i view of sociology. The one protagonist is each of us as an individual. Then all of us in our communities, in our localities, and finally the elected and appointed institutions that are here to help us. Now, each of these protagonists has in itself a particular society building power. But the most important thing is that they work to reinforce each other. The relationship of these three, each to the others, is what will bring out the society building power. But in the end, going from history to the people of the covenant, to the three protagonists, in the end, it comes right down to each of us. Each enkindled soul is the candle that will light the world. So now let's listen to the exact words of the House of Justice. Oops, wrong one. Here it is. Oops. 
Here it is. I'll get us to the beginning of the letter. And please forgive me. I'm not very technically capable. And uh, so I had to roughly draw the numbers. And I have highlighted certain jewels. There are jewels in these paragraphs. So could I ask Margaret to begin the reading? Elaine, the House of Justice letter is not visible. It's not visible. No. It's supposed it's, to be visible. It's still, it's still your uh, point form, your outline. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, hmm. OK, let me try again. I'll stop the screen share. That's that, that should do it. Can you see it now? Yes, it's visible. Wonderful. Margaret, are you available? Mariam, are you there? Yes, I am. If you'd like me to read number two. Um, uh, no, start at the beginning until the we until we hear from Margaret, if you would begin. OK. To the conference of the Continental Boards of Councillors. Dearly loved friends, at Resvan this year, we described how over the course of a quarter century, the Baha'i world underwent a transformation that endowed it with an undreamed of capacity to learn, to grow, and to serve humanity. But however bright were the achievements of this period, they must be eclipsed by what is to come. By the conclusion of the new series of plans recently begun, the Baha'i community will need to have acquired capacities that can scarcely be glimpsed at present. In your deliberations over the coming days, you will be occupied with exploring what is required to bring into being such a fortified community. Baha'u'llah states- uh, This, this right. should be read by Mark. Mark, yes, are you sir. there? Yes, I am. I'll take over. Baha'u'llah states that the purpose for which mortal men have stepped into the realm of being is that they may work for the betterment of the world and live together in concord and harmony. He has revealed teachings that make this possible, building a society that consciously pursues this collective purpose is the work of not only this generation, but of many generations to come. And Baha'u'llah's followers welcome all who labor alongside them in this undertaking. It means learning how to raise up vibrant, outwardly looking communities it means those communities learning how to bring about spiritual and material progress. It means learning how to contribute to the discourses that influence the direction of that progress. These areas of endeavor are naturally familiar ones. Seen from one perspective, they are quite distinct, each having its own characteristics and imperatives, yet they all represent ways of awakening the energies latent in the human soul and channeling them towards the betterment of society. Together, they are the means of releasing what the Guardian described as the society building power of the faith. This inherent power possessed by the cause of Baha'u'llah is visible even in the fledgling efforts of a Baha'i community learning to serve humanity and promote the word of God. And though the world society foreshadowed in his revelation is of course far distant, communities that are earnestly learning to apply his teachings to their social reality abound. How immensely blessed are those souls who alive in the greatness of this day and the significance of their actions strive for the emergence of a society shaped by the divine teachings. Thank you, Mark. Rhonda? 
A series of global plans that began at Rizvan will last a full 25 years. It will carry the arc of the cause into the third century of the Baha'i era and conclude at Rizvan 2046. During this period, the Baha'i world will be focused on a single aim, the release of the society building power of the faith in ever greater measures. The pursuit of this overall aim will require a further rise in the capacity of the individual believer, the local community, and the institutions of the faith. These three constant protagonists of the plan each have a part to play, and each one has capacities and qualities that must be developed. However, each is incapable of manifesting its full potential on its own. It is by strengthening their dynamic relationships with one another that their powers are combined and multiplied. Abdul Baha explains that the more the qualities of cooperation and mutual assistance are manifested by a people, the more will human society advance in progress and prosperity. In the faith, this principle distinguishes and shapes the interactions of individuals, institutions, and communities, and it endows the body of the cause with more vigor and spiritual health. Thank you. Greg? The enkindled souls being raised up through the processes of the plan are seeking to gain an ever more profound understanding of Baha'u'llah's teachings, the sovereign remedy for every disease and to apply them to the needs of their society. They are committed to the prosperity of all, recognizing that the welfare of individuals rests in the welfare of society at large. They are loyal citizens who eschew partisanship and the contest for worldly power. Instead, they are focused on transcending differences, harmonizing perspectives, and promoting the use of consultation for making decisions. They emphasize qualities and attitudes such as trustworthiness, cooperation, and forbearance that are the building blocks of a stable social order. They champion rationality and science as essential for human progress. They advocate tolerance and understanding and with the inherent oneness of humanity uppermost in their minds, they view everyone as, potential as a potential partner to collaborate with and they strive to foster fellow feeling even among groups who may traditionally have been hostile to one another. They are conscious of how the forces of materialism are at work around them, and their eyes are wide open to the many injustice that, injustices that persist in the world. Yet, they are equally clear-sighted about the creative power of unity and humanity's capacity for altruism. They see they see the, the power that true religion possesses to transform hearts and overcome distrust. And so, with confidence in what the future holds, they labor to cultivate the conditions in which progress can occur. They share their beliefs liberally with others, remaining respectful of the freedom of conscience of every soul, and they never impose their own standards on anyone. And while they would not pretend to have discovered all the answers, they are clear about what they have learned and what they still need to learn. Their efforts advance to the alternating rhythm of action and reflection. Setbacks leave them unfazed. In places where growing numbers are helping to build communities of this character, the power of the cause to transform people's social existence, as well as their, as their inner lives, is becoming increasingly visible. Earnest pursuit of the plan's central aim will, we are sure, cause many, many such communities emerge to emerge. Thank you so much. Now I'm hoping that I can just toggle over to this other document. Can you see the outline or do I have to stop screen share and go back in? Uh, doctor, I, I I understand that you would have to stop, and I'm not uh, sure if there's a way to do to to do it a split screen. If anyone knows of that, then they're more see, informed than I am. Can you see it now? We can see you now. You'd have to come back, screen share the the outline. Okay. Yeah. 
I look Perfect. forward. I look forward to learning enough about technology that I could just toggle between the two documents. So, so now we ask ourselves, what did I just hear? I just heard four readers, and they told me that in this new period, new capacities and achievements will eclipse the past and fortify the community. That in the quarter century of the Institute, we, we gained the capacity to learn, to grow, and to serve. But those capacities from the Institute, while continuing to grow, will be eclipsed by new capacities that we can hardly even imagine and that will fortify the community. So this paragraph one is about the period in which we live. Paragraph two is about our pur purpose for being alive. We came forth from nothingness to apply the teachings for the betterment of the world. Baha'is welcome everyone. We are not expecting people to first become Baha'is and then work with us. We'll work with everyone. Our purpose is not market share. Our purpose is to raise a civilization that will better the lives of everyone on earth. Our communities are always outward looking, seeking spiritual and material progress. And we contribute to discourses. There'll be more on this. We involve ourselves in conversations where people are choosing the direction of development. Each protagonist, individuals, communities, and institutions as a special society building power, but it's their relationship that releases the power and combines it and multiplies it. Cooperation and mutual assistance is what leads to progress and prosperity. Just for a moment, consider the conflict, the arguments, the aggression in other forms of governance. Our form of governance, our form of raising the world is through cooperation and mutual assistance between ourselves, our communities, and our institutions. And this is where we get our strength, our moral vigor, and our spiritual health through cooperation. Finally, God created the world and all therein for each of us, that each enkindled soul would fulfill its destiny to bring harmony where there is conflict and to bring prosperity where there is poverty. These enkindled souls, our enkindled souls, we know that Baha'u'llah's teachings are the sovereign remedy for every disease, the ruling remedy, the law, like universal laws. And as enkindled souls, we promote all of these benefits to society, and we view everyone around us as a potential partner. We act and we reflect. That's our modus operandi. That's how we get through every day, every week, every month. We act and we reflect. So let's take a look at what the next section will bring us. The next section talks about the movement of clusters. Now, decades ago, we were accustomed to thinking of the Baha'i world as organized into localities, which would elect their local spiritual assembly. And then, Back around within two years of the same time that the Institute came into being, the Universal House of Justice organized the world into clusters. What is a cluster? A cluster is a collection of one or two or three, depending on the size of areas that are uh, protected, governed, guided by a local spiritual assembly. And the point of all of this was that we could share resources, that we could help each other. Now, how do these clusters develop, advance in maturity? They advance by the light of the revelation. To the degree that we diffuse the light of the revelation, to that degree, 
Our clusters will grow in number, in scale of those participating, and in the quality of the experience of living in those communities. In the coming period, the counselors will assist national spiritual assemblies and the regional Baha'i councils to adjust the number. Sometimes we need to divide a cluster, sometimes we need to add to the cluster, but that's the job of the continental counselors. Now clusters develop along a continuum of three milestones of development, a cluster in which there is the beginning of activity, a, a devotional, a study circle, a children's class, a cluster in which there are so many of these that we want to meet together every three months quarterly and share our experiences and find out what's been happening. So this cycle of expansion and then three months of consolidation, this becomes the engine, that's milestone two. And then milestone three is occurs when there are dozens of facilitators leading hundreds of activities in which thousands of participants are um, active. And if I've got that wrong, please turn to your <laughs> counselors, ABMs, and assistants to correct my understanding. Now, there are some clusters at this third milestone. So wonderful if we have such a one in our region because we can learn from it. We can go visit it. We can talk to those people. We can ask them to come to, to our cluster. So we learn from their example. And most interesting, please mark paragraph nine. Because all these years we've been asking for entry by troops. This paragraph tells us that so many people are involved now in community building activities. Co-workers already involved in junior youth groups, animation and in children's classes and attending devotionals. That there will come a time when a family says to itself, you know, we are part of this Baha'i community. We didn't know it, but we are Baha'is. And the same will happen with groups of peers or friends. So paragraph nine tells us, be ready for substantial growth in your community and welcome those people who have self-identified with the cause of Baha'u'llah because we've been waiting for them. Tell them we've been waiting for them. But in the end, it always comes back to the individual. So counselors and ABMs are urged by the House of Justice to help each of us, each of us believers, learn how to share more freely, more generously, our knowledge of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, because the world is thirsty for it. So let's hear the exact words. I have to stop this. I have to go back over here. And then we go to paragraph five. So is Margaret with us? Can you hear me, Margaret? And are you able to get to your microphone? Yes, I can. I was unable to unmute before, but now, I, <laughs> now you can hear me. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. All right, please read paragraph five. Elaine, you have to put the, um, you have to put the message, screen share the message now. Oh dear, I thought I had done that. Okay. Um, let me see, let me see. Screen share the message. Is it there? Yep, it's there. Okay. <laughs> A greater expression of the society building power of the faith requires, first and foremost, still further advances in the process of entry by troops in every part of the world. The essentially spiritual undertakings of diffusing the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation ever more widely and extending the roots of his faith ever more deeply into the soil of society have measurable outcomes. The number of clusters where a program of growth has been initiated and the degree of intensity that each has reached. The means now exist for a swift advance in relation to both measures. The goal that the community of the greatest name must aspire to fulfill during the current series of global plans is to establish intensive programs of growth in all the clusters in the world. 
This formidable objective implies a broadening and intensification of activity on a scale never witnessed. Rapid progress towards this goal must be achieved in the course of the nine-year plan. Thank you. Mark? As a preliminary step, we ask that you assist national spiritual assemblies and regional Baha'i councils to determine whether their schemes for dividing their territories into clusters would benefit from any adjustments. As you know, the cluster defines an area where the activities of the plan can be stimulated in a manageable and sustainable way. Over the last 21 years, much has been learned about the size of cluster that is manageable in different contexts and in different parts of the world. In some countries, modifications have already begun to be considered, occasioned by the effects of growth. In many instances, this reassessment will not lead to any change, but in some, it will result in a cluster being divided or reduced in size, and occasionally a cluster might become larger. Areas that are sparsely populated owing to the natural terrain may be excluded from the clustering scheme. Of course, any believers who reside in such places would adopt as many elements of the framework for action as are applicable to their circumstances. Wonderful. Um, Rhonda? The movement of clusters along a continuum of development will remain the basic model for the expansion and consolidation of the community. The features of the development path that should be followed, and in particular, the first, second, and third milestones that mark progress along the way are already well known to the friends from our previous messages and from their own experiences, and we feel no need to reiterate what we have stated before. By the close of the one-year plan, we anticipate that programs of growth will be underway in over 6,000 clusters, that in close to 5,000 of these, the second milestone will have, been, will have been passed, and that in 1,300 of these, the believers will have advanced further. These figures must climb considerably over the coming nine years. Once any adjustments to the clustering scheme in each country have been determined, we ask that you work with national assemblies and regional councils to forecast the numbers of clusters where progress could be made past the first, second, and third milestones, respectively, during the plan. It should be borne in mind that these are only intended to be well-informed estimates. They can be refined later as necessary and need not be labored over at length. As such, we request that the results of these assess assessments be sent to the Baha'i World Center by Nauruz. At Rizvan, we will then be able to set, set out the total collective aspirations of the Baha'i World for the nine-year plan. Wonderful. Greg. We are conscious that there are some regions and countries where the faith remains at an early point of development. And there is a pressing need to ensure that what the Baha'i world has learned about accelerating the growth process benefits these places as well. One important lesson that has become clear is the immense value to a region of a cluster where the third milestone has passed, has been passed. Once the friends in a given cluster have developed the range of capacities that such progress implies, and the means to disseminate insights and share experience about community building endeavors are in place, then a swift acceleration of the work of expansion and consolidation in surrounding clusters becomes possible. With this in mind, it is imperative that during the nine-year plan, the process of growth reach this level of intensity at, in at least one cluster in every country and every region. This constitutes one of the plan's chief's chief objectives, and it will call for the concentrated effort of many a sacred soul. The International Teaching Center is ready to work with you to implement several strategies to bring this about. Foremost among these will be the deployment of teams of international and home front pioneers who are familiar with the framework for action and are prepared to dedicate significant amounts of time and energy to serving the cause over a number of years. You will need to impress upon national spiritual assemblies and regional Baha'i councils that urgency of encouraging believers, the urgency of encouraging believers who following in the footsteps of so many heroic souls of the past can arise to ensure 
that the light of the faith shines brightly in every territory. We look in particular to countries, regions, and clusters where strength and experience have accumulated to generate a flow of pioneers to places where help is needed, and also to provide support by other means. This flow of support is one more way in which the spirit of collaboration and mutual assistance, so essential for progress, manifests itself in systematic action. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So I have to stop screen share and start it again to go to the outline. <clears throat> Because of the reading, we can now remind ourselves of certain details. Um, this whole, I, think, Elaine, you know? I think we have two more paragraphs in that section to go. We do? Yes. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. So sorry. Um, going back to the text. Okay, we have nine. Is that you and Greg? That's me no. and Greg, yeah. I'm number 12, I think. Okay, oh. who's nine? Me, Margaret. Oh, hi, Margaret. Oh, great. Go for it. The, accomp the accomplishments of the previous series of plans, particularly the last five-year plan, could not have occurred without a tremendous advance in the teaching work. An important dimension of this work is the capacity to engage in conversations on spiritual themes, a capacity which was explored in our message to your 2015 conference, where we described how it is developed through participation in institute courses and by gaining practical experience. It is evident that the pattern of activity unfolding at the grassroots opens up a variety of settings in which receptive souls, sometimes whole families or peer groups, can take part in meaningful conversations which awaken interest in the vision of the faith and the person of Baha'u'llah. Over time, many such souls begin to identify themselves with the Baha'i community, especially as they gain confidence to participate in community life through service. Of course, the community welcomes any degree of association that a person would like to maintain, great or small. Yet to recognize Baha'u'llah as a manifestation of God, and accept the privileges and responsibilities that are uniquely associated with membership in the Baha'i community is a singular moment in a person's spiritual development, quite distinct from regular involvement in Baha'i activities or voicing support for Baha'i principles. Experience has shown that the environment created by community building endeavors in a locality enables anyone who wishes to take this step to do so with relative ease. Whatever these endeavors are underway, it is important for the friends to remain mindful that the doors of the faith are wide open and to give encouragement to those who stand at the threshold. And in areas where such endeavors have been well established for some time, many believers are discovering that a vibrant expanding pattern of activity can naturally lead to families, groups of friends, and even clusters of households being ready to enter the cause. For in spaces where the possibility of joining the community can be discussed openly and inclusively among those who share a sense of collective identity, souls can more easily feel emboldened to take this step together. Baha'i institutions, especially local spiritual assemblies, must adopt a mindset that allows for such developments and ensure that any obstacles are removed. Thank you. Mark? We ask you and your auxiliaries to help the believers, wherever they reside, reflect periodically on effective ways of teaching the faith in their surroundings and to fan within their hearts a passion for teaching that will attract the confirmations of the divine kingdom souls who have been given the blessing of faith have a natural wish to share this gift through conversations with relatives, friends, classmates, co-workers, and those previously unmet, seeking in every place and at every moment a hearing ear. Different settings and circumstances lend themselves to different approaches 
and the friends should be occupied in an ongoing process of learning about what is most effective in the place where they are. Marvelous. Thank you so much. And thank you for the help to me in figuring out which page we're on. So let's take a look at the outline again and ask ourselves, what did we just hear in this letter? The movement of clusters, the House of Justice is merciful because it gives us this section, which is about something we know a fair degree about. We know that diffusing the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation is what is spreading through the world to expand our active um, communities and clusters, that the society building power will be released as more people join us. Never be afraid of more and more people joining in the process because they bring their own genius, their own talents, their own intelligence, their own leadership their own skills in managing activities and events. We need not fear larger numbers joining us. During this coming 25 years, we will see such intensive growth because we must begin to see it in all clusters in the world. The world is suffering and only people who are organized around the revelation of Baha'u'llah with the love of Baha'u'llah in their souls can become the selfless servants of their communities. So rapid progress towards this goal, very interesting. Have we ever seen the house say must before? Not very often. That is unusual and deserves our attention. So counselors will be asked to review and adjust clusters so that they're an appropriate size for each country. Um, clusters, we're quite familiar with how they mature towards these milestones. And then there's a special emphasis on having a cluster that's at that third milestone. Dozens, if not more, facilitators with hundreds of activities, having thousands of participants. It's very interesting that having just one of these clusters will accelerate growth throughout the whole region. It's kind of like the four minute mile. There was a point in human history where we thought no human being could run a mile in four minutes. And once it happened, suddenly there were all these other people who found they could run a four minute mile. So if we haven't seen and we don't know what a cluster at the third milestone looks like, and we go see one, then we go, then we think, oh, this is possible after all. So that's the importance of having, and the house is very clear, having one of these clusters in every region. I think in British Columbia, we already have more than one of these, but it's, it's partly our population density and so on. But paragraph nine, please read it with a loving heart and pray for the souls that are attracted to a new kind of world where people don't fight with each other to conquer and control, but where people cooperate and assist each other to raise up the whole of the community. Read paragraph nine and pray for the entry by troops, and those wonderful souls that are coming to us. And the counselors and ABMs are reminded to fan our hearts, fan the flame in our hearts, so that each of us, every minute of every day, every conversation, we're looking to hear, to see if there is a hearing ear, someone who wants to talk with us. So, all right, we've been used to this the last 25 years, the movement of clusters. What is this thing that the House of Justice calls a new frontier that's being reveal, revealed at a very few clusters that are long past that third milestone? It tells us that these most advanced clusters in the world, of which there is still only a handful, they focus deeply on their intensive neighborhoods, but they don't forget the rest of the community. 
they enrich the entire community widely. And they know that with those souls enkindled, the whole, the whole enterprise expands through personal networks. The people we shop with, the people we golf with, the people that are part of our healthcare system, the people in our clubs, the people at our workplace, those personal networks are the way that the fragrance is diffused. Now, where there are intense activity areas, we have to become more sophisticated. We have to become more systematic. We have to become more coordinated with those especially intense neighborhoods and districts. And what we see in these most advanced ones in the world is a new frontier where the active Baha'is and their friends are preparing to serve the entire population, 100% of the children, 100% of the junior youth, 100% of the elders, 100% of the hardworking overburdened adults. That's the Baha'i world order, stepping up to take care of a faltering world. As this happens, because it's already happening somewhere, as it happens, local spiritual assemblies will undergo profound change, not only internally in the capacities that they're using, but externally with an expanded vision of their role as they become very visible protagonists in society and start to relate to organizations and governments like, like um, uh, city councils, um, but you know, even if we're not in one of those areas, this is so touching. Do you notice the way every section comes back to the individual? The challenge is essentially the same everywhere, whether large or small. So let's have a look at what the text actually says. And to do that, I have to stop, screen share, and then I have to Start screen share again and go to the text. Okay, and I, I'm ready. Okay, that's Rhonda. Yes. Six years ago, we described for you the characteristics of a cluster where the friends have passed the third milestone along the continuum of growth. To have come this far implies intense activity occurring in specific neighborhoods or villages, but also concerted effort being made by the generality of the believers living across the cluster. In other words, a rising spirit of universal participation in the work of community building. In practice, this means the mobilization of a sizable number of Baha'is who are creatively and intelligently applying the plan's framework for the action of the reality of their own circumstances wherever in the cluster they live. It entails families and individual believers working together and making a conscious decision to see themselves as belonging to an expanded nucleus. Such groups of friends set about the widening the circle of participation in their activities by engaging with the networks to which they belong. Networks created through a place of work or study, a local school or a community hub of another kind, and by accompanying others who arise to serve alongside them. These efforts have tremendous merit. Even when a cluster contains a number of flourishing centers of intense activity, efforts being made across the rest of the cluster might still represent a large proportion of all the activity that is occurring. We also acknowledge in this connection, the steps being taken in some clusters to systematically reach out to a specific population that has shown receptivity to the faith, but is dispersed throughout the cluster. This can be seen as a specialized form of the community building work and one which continues to show great promise. As participation in the work of the plan in all its forms increases, many opportunities emerge for the friends to learn from each other's experience and to kindle within one another the joy of teaching. Of course, the work undertaken in receptive neighborhoods and villages has been a special focus of attention in recent years. As the inhabitants of such locations begin to participate in Baha'i activities in large numbers, more consideration needs to be given to coordination in order to cope with the inherent complexity involved. 
Within each center of intense activity, collaborative arrangements emerge among groups of families who organize community building activities among themselves with a view to widening the embrace of such activities to many nearby households. An informal network of friends provides encouragement and support to the endeavors underway. The character of daily life in such places is adapting to the rise of a culture in which worship and service are cherished activities involving many people at once. Uplifting, well-prepared community gatherings, extending in some cases to camps and festivals, occur with increasing frequency and music and song feature prominently on such occasions. Indeed, the arts as a whole so integral a part of the development of a community from the start, stand out in such meeting in such settings as an important means of generating joy, strengthening bonds of unity, disseminating knowledge, and consolidating understanding, as well as of acquainting those in the wider community with the principles of the cause. And naturally, there remains a strong focus on being outward looking, finding ways to continually share the fruits of a thriving pattern of, of action with souls who are as yet unfamiliar with the faith. There we go. Thank you, Greg. And now Margaret. Amid all this, we have observed a specific heartening phenomenon whose early glimpses we described in our message to your 2015 conference as representing a new frontier Although learning how to embrace large numbers is a characteristic of any cluster where the third milestone has been passed, the focus of the friends necessarily begins to broaden as they approach a point where a significant proportion of the population of a particular area is taking part in community building activities. This might be true for only a specific residential area in a cluster or for several such areas or for a single village. Other parts of the cluster might not yet share the same reality. But in such locations, the thoughts of the friends laboring at the grassroots are increasingly occupied with the progress and well-being of everyone dwelling in the vicinity. Baha'i institutions feel more keenly their responsibility for the spiritual education of an entire generation of children and junior youth most or even all of whom might already be engaged in community activities. Local spiritual assemblies strengthen their relationships with authorities and local leaders, even entering into formal collaborations, and growing attention is given to the multiplying initiatives of social action arising from groups of junior youth, youth, women, families, or others who are responding to the needs around them. The sheer level and variety of activities requires auxiliary board members to appoint multiple assistants to serve a single village or neighborhood. Each assistant might follow one or more lines of action, offering counsel and support as necessary and lending momentum to the processes in motion. Wonderful. Thank you. Mark. In places where the activities of the plan have reached such a degree of prevalence, the inhabitants now possess a substantially increased capacity to steer the course of their own development. And the institutions and agencies of the faith there now have an expanded vision of their responsibilities. Of course, these responsibilities still include having robust systems in place to continually build capacity and support those taking initiative. But the advancement of the community depends to a greater extent than before on local institutions and agencies being conscious of the social forces at work in the environment and acting to preserve the integrity of the community's many endeavors. Meanwhile, the relationship of the Baha'i community to the surrounding society undergoes profound change as represented by its formal structures of administration and informal collaborative arrangements, the, the Baha'i community has become a highly visible protagonist in society in its own right, one that is ready to shoulder important responsibilities and intensify a broad collective process of learning about spiritual and material progress. 
at the same time as the wider society embraces many aspects of Baha'i community life and imbibes its unifying spirit, the dynamics thus created allow diverse groups to come together in a combined movement inspired by Baha'u'llah's vision of the oneness of humanity. To date, the number of places where a Baha'i pattern of community life has attained such prevalence is modest, yet it is growing. Here is witnessed a release of the social, sorry, here is, a, here is witnessed a release of the society building power of the faith, unlike anything that has been seen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very important. And Rhonda, are you available for paragraph 15? Yes. Naturally, prevalence of Baha'i activity on this scale is not a prospect everywhere. It is necessary to appreciate the difference that is made by the conditions in a cluster or in parts of a cluster and by the characteristics of a people, that is, by the reality of circumstances. Accordingly, the ways in which the society building power of the faith will find expression in different settings will vary. But regardless of the extent to which Baha'i community life embraces those who reside in a particular area, regardless even of the intensity of a program of growth in a cluster or the level of activity in a neighborhood or village, the challenge facing the friends serving at the grassroots is essentially the same in every place. They must be able to read their own reality and ask what, in light of the possibilities and requirements at hand, would be fitting objectives to pursue in the coming cycle or series of cycles. You and your auxiliaries are ideally placed to put this question and to ensure that appropriate strategies are identified. Much can be learned from the experience of the friends in similar clusters, for a community that is a step further along the same path can provide valuable insights about the goal to strive for next. As the friends ponder what is before them, they will readily see that for every community, there is a goal in reach and for every goal, a path to reach it. Looking ahead on this path, might we not perceive Baha'u'llah himself, the reins of humanity's affairs in one hand, his other beckoning all to hasten, hasten. Thank you so much, thank you. So this is a degree of development that very few of us have witnessed, especially in the Americas, uh, in Europe, we don't see this kind of um, society embracing capacity, but it's coming to all of us. And let's take a look in more detail at what this section has told us. It told us that those clusters which have passed the third milestone, there's universal participation. And the universal participation is because everyone, not just those in the focus areas of intensive activity, but everyone across the entire cluster are part of the community building, mobilizing intelligence and creativity in every neighborhood. That each person and family belongs to an expanding nucleus of activity that continually widens participation and that it's by personal networks that these um, involvements uh, engage more and more people. Now, specific populations may, so it's not a geographic locality, but it may be a linguistic locality. As it happens in this area of British Columbia, we have special population groups speaking Arabic, speaking Chinese, speaking whatever, these may be, um, able to develop together, though they are spread across the cluster. Intense activity is going to require more coordination because we actually have whole families as the active um, agents. We have a new culture, which is the anticipation of Mashrika Laskar everywhere in the world, where the day begins with worship and then it proceeds to activity and service these devotional programs that we're holding that then lead to some kind of involvement in the in community service this we are we are practicing the form of the meshrikalas car 
and uh, um, and um, some of these advanced communities are holding larger festivals everywhere we can include arts and music and spread the joy of the faith. So this new frontier that many of us have yet to see is one in which the Baha'i community and its, its friends and coworkers are able to serve an entire generation. And in doing so, for example, here in the, um, in the area of Vancouver and Surrey, the local authorities like the municipal councils have departments that serve disadvantaged populations that have special programs uh, and resources available for youth groups that we could take advantage of and cooperate with that have neighborhood development departments. So the civil order has, has done its best absent of the revelation of Baha'u'llah to serve the population. If we join with them, keeping in mind, and somewhere in here is the word integrity, the integrity is that we always keep in mind the guidance of the revelation in our decisions about action. So all of this activity is going to require more and more support for multiple assistance as signed by the um, auxiliary board members. The LSA, apart from its, its enduring support to build capacity and support initiatives, there's that word integrity, preserve the integrity of the community's endeavors so that we always, we always get our guidance from the revelation and, and the letters of the institutions. But the LSA itself, is becoming a highly visible protagonist in multi-faith work, but also in social and economic development. What are the Baha'is up to? They will turn to our local spiritual assemblies as the corporate body that speaks officially for the Baha'i community. But our job is to uh, act as the catalyst that brings together um, groups that are inspired by the same values, we say like-minded groups to work in support of each other. And I love the way it comes down, every section comes down to the individual and says, dear heart, if you are alone, if you are one of a handful in some part of the world, your job is essentially the same as those large um, uh, habitats full of hundreds and thousands of people. Dear heart, your job is to read your own reality and find in your community a reasonable goal and find the path that leads to the goal. And here is perhaps the most transformative sentence of the entire letter, I dare to say. Looking ahead on this path, might we not perceive Baha'u'llah himself saying to each of us, the reins of humanity's affairs in one of his hands, saying to each of us, his other hand beckoning, hasten. Do what you can, life is short, hasten along this path. So now we come to the concluding chapter, um, concluding section for today, which is the one that actually spells out what social and economic development, what social transformation will look like from the Baha'i perspective. Baha'is are not a bunch of do-gooders taking care of other people's problems. We are building capacity and working with our neighbors to build all of our capacity. The Baha'i focus is always on building the capacity of everyone because together in our neighborhood, we're going to take care of the economic, social, and cultural barriers that are impeding the development of our youth and our children. And this common framework is the framework we have always practiced 
of studying the writings, consulting together about what it means, consulting about how it applies to our locality, consulting about what are reasonable goals, taking action towards those goals, and then reflecting on what we were able to achieve to figure out which part will we continue, which part will we adjust. That common framework, whether we are working in the environment, in arts, in agriculture, in health, in education, whatever sector it is that you and I are drawn to serve, that common framework is what brings us all into one common endeavor. And more and more we'll get used to the idea of a public discourse. A discourse is a conversation that examines values, principles, and tries to understand what principle applies to the problem we're trying to solve in a personal conversation, in our locality, in our nation. We have offices of external affairs in, in each nation to speak to the national government. And we have the Baha'i International Community to speak to the United Nations in many of its offices and many of its programs. But this faith has room for the talent and the genius and the intelligence and the heart and the commitment of every individual. Again, this section will end with the individual. So let's go look at the text and see exactly what it says. Um, shall I start then? Okay. I think, I think it's you. I think yes. it's you. Contributing to social transformation. The revelation of Baha'u'llah is concerned with the transformation of both humanity's inner life and social environment. A letter written on behalf of Shoghi Effendi describes how the social environment provides the atmosphere in which souls can grow spiritually and reflect in the full light of God shining through the revelation. A clear sign that the society building power of the cause is being released in the cluster is that efforts are being made by a growing band of its inhabitants inspired by the teachings of the faith to help improve the spiritual character and social conditions of the wider community to which they belong. The contribution made by Baha'is is distinguished by its focus on building capacity for service. It is an approach founded on faith in the ability of a population to become the protagonists of their own development. Margaret. As the intensity of community building work in a cluster increases, the friends there inevitably become more conscious of social, economic, or cultural barriers that are impeding people's spiritual and material progress. Children and junior youth lacking support in their education, pressures on girls resulting from traditional customs related to early marriage, families needing help with navigating unfamiliar systems of health care, a village struggling for want of some basic necessity, or longstanding prejudice arriving, arising from a legacy of hostility between different groups. When a Baha'i community's efforts in the field of expansion and consolidation bring it into contact with these situations and many others, it will be drawn to respond to such realities as its circumstances permit. In reflecting on such situations, it becomes evident that within clusters, expansion and consolidation, social action, and contributing to prevalent discourses are dimensions of a single unified outward looking endeavor carried out at the grassroots of society. All these efforts are pursued according to a common framework for action. And this above all else brings coherence to the overall pattern of activity. Thank you so much, Margaret. The initial stirrings of grassroots social action begin to be seen in a cluster as the availability of human resources increases in capacity for a wider range of tasks develops. Villages have proven to be notably fertile ground from which social action initiatives have emerged and be sustained. But in urban settings too, 
friends living there have succeeded in carrying out activities and projects suited to the social environment. At times by working with local schools, agencies of civil society, or even government bodies, social action is being undertaken in a number of important fields, including the environment, agriculture, health, the arts, and particularly education. Over the course of the nine-year plan, and especially as the study of specific institute courses stimulates greater activity in this area, we expect to see a proliferation of formal and informal efforts to promote the social and economic development of a people. Some of these commonly based initiatives will require basic administrative structures to sustain their work. Where conditions are propitious, local spiritual assemblies will need to be encouraged to learn how to best to cultivate new fledgling initiatives and to foster efforts that show promise. In some cases, the needs associated with a particular field of endeavor will warrant the establishment of a Baha'i inspired organization. And we anticipate the appearance of more such organizations during the coming plan. For their part, national spiritual assemblies will have to find ways in which they can stay well informed about what is being learned at the grassroots of their communities and analyze the experience being gained in some places. This will call for the creation of an entire entity dedicated to following social action. Looking across the Baha'i world, we are delighted to see how much momentum has already been generated in this area of endeavor through the encouragement and support of the Baha'i International Development Organization. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Rhonda? Closely connected with the capacity for engaging in social action is a capacity for contributing to the discourses of society. At heart, this is simply a capacity for participating in a conversation about a matter that affects people's lives and an offering of a perspective grounded in Baha'i principles and Baha'i experience. Viewed in this way, it is a skill which many Baha'i have the opportunity to practice almost daily, for instance, in their studies or occupations, and which is cultivated through the involvement in institute courses in its more formal expression. It is central to the work of the Baha'i international community and national offices of external affairs. However, in relation to the release of the society building power of the faith at the grassroots, it is a capacity that comes into greater demand as closer association with the population brought about through the work of expansion and, cons and consolidation leads to increased consciousness of an area's prevailing social problems, as well as the aspirations of its people to overcome them. As the number of those participating in community building activities rises, so does the need for the Baha'i community to offer as a unified body its considered perspective on obstacles to social progress and on issues that weigh on the minds and spirits of those with whom it interacts. This has particular implications for local spiritual assemblies. In places where the activities of the plan have gained a degree of prevalence, the assembly brings to be, begins to be viewed more widely as a source of moral insight. Over time, efforts to contribute to societal discourses become more systematic and Baha'is be, Baha become more adept at, the, at helping those around them to engage constructively in a discourse and find consensus. Opportunities are sought out to share the perspectives of the faith with community leaders and figures in authority, and spaces are created in which the representatives of various groups and interests can be assisted to reach a common point of view through consult, consultation. We are pleased with the steps that have already been taken to learn how insights from the revelation of Baha'u'llah and from the experiences of Baha'i communities can be brought to bear upon pressing social issues at the local level. Much more is sure to be learned in this regard during the nine-year plan. And our final paragraph today, Greg? We wish to stress that historically and now, Social action and efforts to participate in the prevalent discourses of society have emerged not only in the context of growth, but also as a result of individual Baha'is striving to contribute to society's progress in ways available to them. As a personal response to Baha'u'llah's summons to work for the betterment of the world, believers have variously chosen to adopt certain vocations and have sought out opportunities to support the activities of like-minded groups and organizations. Projects, both large and small, have been started in order to respond to a range of social issues. 
numerous Baha'i-inspired organizations have been established by groups of individuals to work for many different objectives, and specialist entities have been founded to give attention to a particular discourse. All of these efforts, at whatever scale they have been undertaken, have benefited from being able to draw on the principles and insights guiding the activities occurring at the grassroots of the worldwide Baha'i community. And they have also benefited from the wise councils of local and national spiritual assemblies. We rejoice to see these diverse harmonious expressions of faith by the devoted believers of the blessed beauty in response to the tribulations of a perplexed and sorely agitated world. Thank you so much. So the world is full of people and organizations that want to improve at least the economic, but also the social conditions. What's important for us as Baha'is is to focus on what is the defining distinctive perspective of Baha'is on social development. And it's in, it's, we've just heard it in this section. So let's take a look. Can you see the outline now? Yes. Yes, okay, good. So let's take a look again to just review what our readers presented to us. How is it that Baha'i Baha communities contribute to social transformation? The key is that we are not here to do for others. We are here to raise up among all of our peers and neighbors the capacity to help ourselves, to improve the spiritual character and social conditions of all of us. It's a faith in the ability of every population. Wherever we are, our neighbors can all become protagonists of development where we live. So we are responding with that common framework we talked about, wherever we're applying it, whether it's education, healthcare, uh, basic needs of food and shelter, prejudices, hostility. Each of us has some piece of this moving, this remember, this is a ship and this ship has many moving parts, expansion, consolidation of the community, social action and social discourse. It's all part of the one great cultural ship that is under development. We work with that common framework of study, action and reflection that brings coherence to the pattern of our activity. Now this social action, we have to accept what is within reach where we are. If we're in a large urban setting, some of us have been able to see cooperation with schools, with organizations that support a particular cause or with local government bodies. The Institute courses, particularly the ones 11, 12, 13, 14 are beginning to show us how to undertake these different kinds of activity and these activities are overshadowed by the care, the protection, the encouragement, the love of our LSAs and our NSA. At the international level, our whole effort for the benefit of the planet is um, championed by the Baha'i International Development Organization. It will be gathering all of our experiences and formulating it into a way that we can learn from each other all around the world. These public um, discourses that we are engaging in will share Baha'i principles and Baha'i experience. And this is where our confidence comes from. It doesn't come from theory. It doesn't even come from the sacred writings. It comes from what we know happened as we began to apply these principles in, in to the problems of our immediate surrounding society. We know what we know because we've lived it. LSAs will become recognizable to municipalities 
as a source of moral principle and as, as a cultural uh, solvent to help others come together, others that aren't used to working with each other. The Baha'is are there to bring everyone into the same room to work together on problems. In the end, it comes, there's room in this cause for the individual and their personal initiatives, whether it means um, establishing a Baha'i-inspired organization, undertaking a personal project. Um, we have this diversity of harmonious expressions of the faith. So, whoops, I think I need to do that screen share again. And go to a summary of the whole, of the whole morning. What have we learned? In the introduction, we learned that we exist, we live, we came forth from nothingness to apply the teachings. In the section on clusters, we learned why the third milestone cluster is so important because all of the localities around such a cluster can learn from it and be accelerated in their own development. We saw that the most advanced clusters in the world are breaching a new frontier where they're able to serve everyone in the vicinity. That's the new world order, stepping up to serve humanity. And we understood that the distinctive way that Baha'is undertake social development is through encouraging capacity in every single person and to work together in this common framework of consultation and application in whatever area. So I want to say in conclusion, congratulations, you actually managed to be here through this whole thing, which is six pages of a 13 or 14 page letter. What we think we've accomplished today is only the first half. So I encourage you to have a wonderful week and to stay tuned because the best is yet to come. What we've heard so far is something that's actually fairly familiar to the Baha'i world. But the second half of the letter for which the first half prepared us is going to talk about that global culture where life for everyone everywhere is enriched through learning. And the second half is going to tell us what's, what's about to happen within the administrative order and how it will be enhanced with new capacities. So. Thank you very much, Elaine. Yes, thank you, Elaine. That was, that was stimulating. In the thank you very much, Elaine. And um, please join us next week for the second session of uh, of these two, the second and final session. Um, I do believe people have asked for both the highlighted message that you have, um, that you were posting, as well as the outline. Uh, so I have taken the liberty of letting people know that next week, both of those things would be available. I would. I hope that that's a possibility, Elaine. I was. I was told that that's something that could be uh, provided. I'll need somebody's help, but technically, to figure out how we do that for everyone. Okay, great. So I hope to see everybody in the next session, where we will be fielding questions and comments from um, all of you. Thank you very much. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead, Elaine. I just wanted to um, bid farewell and thank people again for attending and leave you with this blessing from a prayer that's quite familiar to us. O oh, thou provider, send down thy aid that each one here may become a lighted candle, each one a center of attraction, each one a summoner to thy heavenly realms, till at last we make this nether world the mirror image of thy paradise. Baha'u'llah. Thank you, Elaine.